Thank you all for coming today and it's seriously such an honour to be here. Thank you Rashenda for asking me to come along and share this story. Um, I've spent most of this week in bed um, and lost my voice so I'm a bit <laughs> choky today and also my last meeting of the day I had a coughing fit and had to run out of the room which was kind of awkward. So hopefully Dan here today can tag team with me if that happens tonight but let's just hope it doesn't otherwise I've got my thank you water here. <laughs> so I'm here today to share with you the story and the journey that we've been on. So for those of you who don't know Thank You Water, and some of you may have done your research before coming, we started a bottled water company. Now, basically this is all coming, you would have seen this on the invite, when I was um, about 14 years of age I had the opportunity to go to Indonesia. And when I went there I thought I'm going to go there to help them and I'm going to be, make such a difference in their life and when I came back I realised at that young age I think they helped me more than I helped them. I think they showed me so much more and then I realised when I grow up, whatever I do in my life, I want to be able to do something to be able to give back to them. And so whatever it was that I was doing, I wanted to be able to make sure that it, you know, it can funnel back to them in some way. And then I went through, you know, had to finish uni and not uni, sorry, high school and all that and started doing all these different jobs and wasn't feeling like I was really on that, you know, stage that I wanted to be at. And I met this man, actually boy, shall I say, <laughs> at 19 years of age, who had very similar passions and dreams to what I had. And at that time he'd come across this thought, um, this um, thought about in Australia here, we spend $600 million on the bottled water industry. $600 million is here and alone. Worldwide it's $50 billion. Yet at that same time, 900 million people don't have access to safe water. These are hard to swallow, easy to follow facts. Right? So we were just like, well, what can we do? This just doesn't seem right. Dan was researching all these different, you know, stories about it and he saw this boy the same age as him who spent his whole day going to collect water. When we think about all the things that we can get done and do in a day, imagine if every single day the only task you had to do was to go get water. He's thinking, surely this boy has a future. Surely he wants to do something with his life and have a career or something like that. But this water that he was getting, that he thought he was helping his family, ended up killing them. So here he was thinking he's doing, well not his whole family, there was a couple of members in his family that ended up killing. So here he is thinking he's doing a good thing, and yet it's actually not doing it. So we're like, what can we do? And I remember those early stages, we were throwing around all these different ideas of what we could do and we were tossing up all these random ideas and we finally got to this idea of, well, let's just start a bottled water company. Let's, let's just, you know, as you do, let's just start a bottled water company. So we did and we decided, we went through all these different avenues of what we could do and how we could do it and we decided we wanted to start a social enterprise. So all of the profit, after the cost of actually making it and, and getting it out on the market and that sort of thing, what we have left over from that then goes to fund water projects in developing countries. Every single bottle provides a month's worth of water to somebody in need. Now, it's actually a bit awkward today that Dan's here. This is the first time he's ever heard me talk. <laughs> and so I'm feeling a little bit awkward that he's here today. Not, not everybody else here, just Dan. <laughs> That's funny. So, I just wanted to ask a question quickly. Just a little question, and my hand is up for this one. Can you guys put up your hand if you think bottled water, right? Like the concept of bottled water comes from a tap. Why do we have to buy it in a bottle? It's just a little bit silly. Yeah? Okay, now put your hand up again, that was everyone in the room, put your hand up again if ever in your life you've bought a bottle of water. Yeah, so even though we think the idea is silly, we still buy it because we love the convenience of it. We don't want to buy a Coke or a, um, some other sugared water or um, something like that. We want to buy something that's healthy for us and that's convenient. So now, and I don't mean this in a guilt trip way, can I ask people to put up your hand if in any way you've been able to fund directly water projects in a developing country? So a couple of people in this room. Good work, guys. Um, but basically, and like I said, it's not a guilt trip for everybody else here, but basically to show you why we exist. It's to provide an opportunity for everyone to be able to give in their everyday life. While we love charities and what they do, not all the time is everyone at the position where they're able to give to charities um, on a monthly basis or on a continual basis and so forth. So we've created a way to be able to support charities by using consumer goods that people are going to use on a day-to-day -day basis and to be able to give to those people who really need it. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story and how we started. Firstly, 
it all came with a team. So when we started, you know, Dan was like, you know, we're gonna do something, what can we do? And a couple of us got together, there's about five of us to start with, and we're all doing these brainstormings in the parents' lounge room, as you do, around the table or something like that. And we're all discussing what we can do and how to start it, and we're all doing different things here and there, different um, roles. What was one of the roles, Dan? You told someone just to research, um, like, was it gyms or something like that? Like, go research gyms and every gym we can try and get into. I don't think we got into any, but <laughs> we're trying. Um, and basically when we started, you know, like, how do you start a bottled water company? So the first thing I think we did was hit Google. How do you start a bottled water company? <laughs> um, and then Dan also had a uni assignment he had to do on finding someone who'd started up a business and write about it. So he called someone who'd started a bottled water company and asked them and pretty much got all the information information, most of the information we needed, um, and we, you know, worked from there and did our own little thing here and there. But then, right, is we, we visited all these different factories, right, and we put on this little bit of a facade. At the time, it was just the boys at that time, and they put on their parents' suits, driving in the driveway, took down the pee plates from the car so they wouldn't look too young and unprofessional or whatever. Go in, do this big facade. We're starting something. It's going to be really big. We can't tell you what it is. But we just need to know if you've got the capacity to be able to handle us. And sort of looking at us like, hey. Um, OK, and so we found out more information. We went from factory to factory to factory, found out that we needed about 250 50 grand to start up. Now at this point, we probably, when I mean, you joke about this, the five of us were all uni students, we probably had a combined net worth of about a grand. And we didn't really have exactly really majorly rich parents that could all contribute in 250 grand. So we continued going on and on. We got to the last factory, we pulled down that whole facade and we just told him what we wanted to do. He sat back in his chair and was like, you guys for real? And we're like, yeah. And now he also, even though he's been 15 years in the bottled water industry, thinks that bottled water is silly. And he goes, I think this is a great idea. We are able to um, cover the upfront costs. So we did like this cash um, flow thing where um, he produced it, we were able to sell it and then pay him back afterwards, which actually got that rolling. But another thing that we needed as well was a bottle mould. We found out it was about 50 grand in every state, right? So around, around that time. And we needed a bottle mould. It didn't have to be unique, but we needed something to be able to put our water in. So we went to Vizzy. You guys heard of Vizzy? Yep, I'm getting some nods. And we got a meeting somehow with their CEO. We had a 15 minute meeting, because that's what we asked for. We probably ended up having five minutes of him just shooting questions going do 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 and he then asked this question that we probably should have thought about before we went in there. You see, I, I was in this, but I remember Dan showing me with this story. He had this real romantic, you know, vision, probably seeing it from like Hollywood movies or whatever, that you go in there and brainstorm, we can do this and we can do that, we can do this. But he's like, what do you want? And Dan's like, oh. I probably should have thought of that before I went in. He was like, um, and he said some crazy amount, like 10 million bottles for free. And the guys were sort of like, okay. And the guys that were with him at the time were like, oh my gosh, we weren't expecting that, that's awkward. Walked out of the room, he replied back like a couple of days later and said, look, we can't do the $10 million, but we can give you 33,000 bottles for free and a bottle mold for free. So that wiped out all of our upfront costs that we needed to be able to get everything rolling. We went back to the guy at the factory and we said, you know, we've got this bottle mold, let's get this rolling. He's like, but how are you getting out on the shelves? You realize the bottled water industry is very big, very competitive. How are you going to get on there? We said, oh, we've got this meeting with this guy from this place called NBC. He was like, NBC? And he started doing this laugh. And it wasn't a laugh like, yeah, it's awesome laugh. It was a, you got to be kidding me laugh. Like he was laughing at us. And we're like, yeah, NBC. And he was like, you realize NBC, uh, Australia's private beverage distributor? And we're like, yeah. They're like, they only take on big brands like, you know, Lipton Ice Tea, Red Bull, so forth. They won't take on a no brand like you guys. I'm like, well, you know, we've got a meeting. We'll try and get in there, see what we can do. We booked a, a short meeting, like I think it was a half an hour meeting or something with the guy. We ended up getting in there, 
after about two hours in this meeting, he ended up giving us first order of 50,000 bottles. I think we were not expecting that one bit at all. All we had in the meeting was this little piece of paper of this, I think it was a person from Africa with thank you written over the top and sort of really unprofessional, just going, this is what we're going to do and we're going to change the world and that you're going to be part of it and, and all this. And he ended up just believing into it and buying into it and, and giving us this chance and, and getting the 50,000 bottles. Came out of that meeting, then realised, oh, we are, this is actually happening. This is actually starting to roll, and we hadn't got to that point. Because when you once you do a deal like this, before you do that, you've got to do those things, you know, start up businesses, getting your business registered, all those kind of things. And so we worked out with all the costs of all of that, we needed twenty grand in cash, in hand. So. Being uni students again, couldn't really get that from nannying, which I was doing at the time. Um, so we were, we were trying to work out how we're going to do this. Now Dan had initially met with this one of his business mentors, right? Now his business mentor that he spoke with a few months prior, he told him the whole idea, and the guy's like, "Oh yeah, that's interesting." He was thinking, oh, he's not as rich as I thought he was. He seriously thought he was going to give him, you know, a million dollars or something like that. And he just said, oh, that's interesting. And so from there, he met up with him a couple of months later and he shared in the story. And this is, this is something that's, um, I guess, really important, I guess, is that momentum gets things happening. So because we had the factory and we had um, the orders ready to go and everything was all starting to roll, he, asked, he was having a conversation with the guy um, and he started to share. He's like, oh, how's that little water thing coming along? He's like, yeah, well, we've got a factory and we've got 50,000 bottles um, ready to go on the shelves. He's like, how are you paying for all this? He's like, oh, kind of went red in the face. And so he said, well, how much do you need? And he's like, well, 20 grand. He's like, okay, whoa, that's a lot. And just left it at that. And then thinking, he is not as rich as I thought he was. And then a couple of days later, he sent us a, an email and said, me and my business partner, we want to give you the 20 grand. He said, it's just a gift, it's a donation, we don't want anything back, no strings attached. And so we had this to be able to set everything up from, there, from then on. So it was all very exciting times, everything's all happening and I think in, in all of this, oh my clicker's gone missing, does anybody know where my clicker is? I've, I've stuck it in the back of my pocket, sorry. <laughs> Is the startup is we've gone through this this statement is that impossibility is only someone's opinion, not a fact. See, when we had started all this, there's even that business mentor at the beginning was like, oh yeah, well, but oh, but what about this? Oh, you guys probably should finish your uni degrees first and then get into what you're doing, or you should maybe wait till you got a lot of money behind you first before you can do this. And you get so many when you want to start something, you get so many people just want to try and shut that down, you know, or try and say their opinions and that sort of thing. And I think you've got to realise that when you want to actually go and do something, it's only someone's opinion, is, impossibility is only someone's opinion. It's not a fact. All right, the next thing was, oh, this is the first run of bottles that we did. That's one of the other directors showing off all the bottles. And first run, and then we step into the realities of business. So this is where we come across this. Success can be defined as the ability to turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones. And this is where it started to get a little bit tough. Going back to this one here, is we had our, one of these pallets, right, delivered to Dan's parents' garage, and we were so excited. First run, this has actually happened. We're pulling it off the pallet going, oh my gosh, this is exciting. I'm watching the guys' faces, they're pulling it off, looking at, this has become a reality. Next minute, I'm seeing their faces just drop, I'm like, what is going on? The bottles, right, the labels around the bottle were scrunched up all the way around to the point where you couldn't read it. And we were like, this is not good. We had to call that guy from NBC, that one that only takes on big brands. We had to give him a call and say, um, so this is what's happened. And he said, um, do you realize that you're asking me to do a national recall? We're like, yeah. He's like, do you realize that that destroys big brands? We're like, yeah. Do you realize that I don't do second chances? And then he said, but I will this time. And lucky for us, he gave us a third and a fourth and a fifth because this factory kept having issues like this. And it was quite quite difficult and quite, well, here we are just trying to do a good thing. We're working our side jobs, we're doing our uni, juggling everything, trying to make this work and we're having all these issues. 
we get to the point where we're able to grow enough to get 350 customers around Australia. We had a new distributor in Queensland. We're starting to really take off. Then all of a sudden this factory decides that they weren't going to produce for us for about five weeks. Five weeks may not sound long, but it meant that we lost 300 of our 350 customers. It's at this point where we were just like, what the heck, do we just high five one another, go, yeah, we built a well and just leave it at that? Do we just like go, you know, like we tried, we're making it work, it doesn't really seem like it's working. However, around this same point where we're going, what do we do? We got this factory approach us. They came in, by this time we had this little tiny office at the back of somebody else's office. It's like this little room where we're all squished in. And um, they came to us and said, can we do a presentation? So we used the, the boardroom of this other business and they did this little PowerPoint presentation for us. We're like, what is going on? Someone's pitching to us this time. And they're doing this presentation and they're one of Australia's leading private um, bottling factories. They smashed this factory in regarding the quality of, of water, quality of um, the product, in regards to the um, ability to be able to distribute, the capacity, the price, the environmental side of things. In every single way, they were beating the other factory and they were wanting us to go to them. And we were like, oh, look, I have to talk to our board and get back to you on that. And so the next day we could not wait to pick up the phone and say, please, yes, we want to come on board with you guys. And that's when we started to take off again. And we did a new relaunch. Sorry. With the new relaunch, we actually had a, a distribution company in um, New South Wales. They promised the world, they said um, that they were able to get us into 2,000 outlets around Sydney. We were like, that is amazing. Incredible, 2,000 times anything on a calculator is a good number. And so we'll, we'll do that. So we send off a, um, a truckload, literally a truckload of water to them. And then we're waiting for the invoice to come through and we're waiting and we're waiting. Then we got a letter from a um, solicitor telling us that they had actually gone under. And they owed us about 20 grand. And we were like, you've got to be kidding me. As a startup business, cash flow is really important. Plus, we need this 20 grand can go a lot further, you know, um, than into nowhere. So we, we ended up getting that back over a year, but it was still very hard for us at that, at that time and, and situation, especially as we're trying to take off again to all of a sudden have this knockback. And we're still thinking, should we really be going with this still? Like, should we still really be doing this? Is it really all the hard work? And we were like worked out over the year how much we were able to give and it, we probably should have just gone and worked out full-time jobs and given out of our salaries. Probably would have been able to give more. But in the end, we were able to see that we were able to, like we could see the vision of where this was going and what we wanted to do and I'll, I'll go into where we are now a little bit later. But what kept us going at that time is that we had a, a deal going at the time. We had two deals actually. Um, one was about three months in the making, another one was about nine months in the making. And we were doing this we were, um, pitching, going back and forward and that sort of thing. And to get, both of them came back to us and they said our least favourite line, we're not going to go ahead with Thank You Water. And this is a lot of hard work going through it. But I think what crushed us even more was then they both, both of these like small retailers bought out their own bottle of water that went to helping people in developing countries. And while we were like, well, you know, good, at least the profit's going to people who need it. But we put in all this hard work and we were needing that to be able to continue to grow further. So it was just really, it was really discouraging at the time. But what kept us going is we had another deal that we were going with. And it was for one of the two big supermarkets. I can't really tell you which one because we all want to be friends in the end one day. But one of these big supermarkets, either the red or the green one, we were pitching to. And we went for about a year and it's going back and forward, all these, you know, different things that we had to do. And eventually it came to uh, about a year and the buyer said, you're in. We were like, what? He said, you're in, you're in, you can bank on it. I, I promise you, you can bank on it. So like, this is awesome. We started to do a little bit of a celebration. This is exciting. Wait a couple of weeks for their first order to come through. Dan was like, we've got to pick up the phone. Where's this order coming? Calls up, picks up the phone and a new guy answers. And he's like, oh, where's the old guy? He's like, oh, he's been moved to the broom section. All right, cool. I'll give him a call. Gave him a call. He's like, oh no, it's okay, Dan. I told the new guy all about you. You're still going to be in. No worries. Worries, no problem. We call him up and then all of a sudden he's like, nah, I'm in charge now. I've got my big brand, I've got my home brand and I don't want your whatever water. 
And it was another crushing moment. It's like, what? Is no one seriously getting on board with this? And I've just realised I've forgotten to keep track of the time. We're good? What are we up to? <laughs> so the next thing from there was... Um, uh, you know, this crushing thing, but what kept us going is we were working with a big retailer. We had to jump a lot of hurdles. We worked out with this big retailer, they were able to help, figures correct in, about 60 to 90,000 people per year through the volume of water that they would have gone through. So we jumped lots of hurdles with them. We jumped like seven different hurdles. The last one was price point beating the competitor that was already in there. And we got to that point where we were able to work with our factory and suppliers and all that and we were able to beat that price point. And it was quite amazing. We were like, this is incredible. We've worked so hard on them. We had great relationships with the team that we're working with in house. In, in, um, in <laughs> then all of a sudden, we, went, we actually had our honeymoon at the time. This was in 2010. And... Um, Oh, it's gone to sleep. There you go. We got, a, um, we got a phone call. We actually got two phone calls when we came back from our honeymoon. And should I just say, just after our honeymoon, we went to Cambodia um, just afterwards. And we got to actually see the project that we had funded. And we got to see these stories. And I'll go on to that a little bit later down the track. But these stories really impacted us and really showed us this is why we're doing it. This is why we've got to keep going on. These people's lives are counting on it and it makes such a big difference. And so we got back home to Australia, got two phone calls. The second one was from this big retailer that I was talking about. And they said, while you were away, the other competitor did a deal with senior management, have locked you out, you can't talk to us for over a year. And still today, that was 2010, we haven't been able to still get back in there because of this deal that was created with senior management. They just, you know, s smashed some money on the table or whatever and locked us out. And it was at that point we were like, you've got to be kidding. A, like a year of working with this, we've gotten so close. It's got to help so many people. And just because of this money situation, it's really been knocked out. But the first phone call that we got was a very exciting one. We actually got this phone call from Australia Post. Now we had pitched to them in amongst all of this chaos that was going on and um, they said, oh, look, probably don't bother pitching. We have a policy where nothing that goes in your mouth goes in the store. It's been there for about 150 years, it's not going to change. And we said, oh, look, do you mind, maybe we can come and chat with you anyway. We did no presentation, we literally just had a chat with the guy. He said, you know what, I'd like to see this policy changed. Maybe we'll see what we can do. A couple of months later, he gave us a call and said, we've got a new CEO, we're putting forward to changing the policy, maybe you can come in. Now, all the big players out there, all our competitors would have paid so much to try and get in there to be able to actually have that position and have that promotion in there. They have about a million people come through their store every day. I mean, how many people here have been in the Australia Post queue before and you're just like sitting there for ages? So it's actually right in the queue now and they, rolled, they did an initial trial and now they've rolled us into all 850 ish, probably growing outlets around Australia. So it's now even in the rural areas as well. So that was very exciting for us. And, and um, I think in amongst all of these knockbacks, it was a little, you know, ex glimpse of excitement. But also um, what I'm just going to show is before I go on to the next stage of the journey, the exciting bit, I wanted to go back to our projects trip that we did in Cambodia. Now with our projects what we do is we have what we call a project based model. So we don't have, get all the money that we have, just give it to a charity and go, there you go, do what you want with it. What we have is a project based model. This is really important for us to know exactly where our money is going so that we can then communicate it to people who buy our water. So what happens is a, project will, a, a charity will submit a project to us and say this is the project that we're doing, this is how many people it's helping and then we have a heap of requirements. Has to be able to, um, the community has to be involved and there's all these different elements that we have to, in order to make sure that the project is sustainable, it's going to last long term, it's easy to get fixed if it was to, broke, to get broken and that sort of thing. And when we were there, I got to hear some amazing stories. And I realised that what we're doing is so much more than just giving someone clean water. It was actually giving someone hope for their life. Like it was give, lifting them out of poverty. We went to one place, for example, and I'll be quick because I'm not sure where I'm at with time. But one place, for example, we went to and I said, what's it like now that you don't have water? She's like, oh, I'm not sick anymore. I'm like, oh, that's great. Like, what's it like now that you're not sick anymore? She's like, well, we don't have to spend all the medical expenses that we were spending on our family. So instead of spending all the medical expenses on us just being sick, that money was then able to buy this plough. 
And I look over and I see this motorized plow that they're able to get for their, for their family. And it dawned on me that now that money is generating money for their families. Their children can then go to school as well. They're able to start to be able to lift themselves out of poverty. And there were so many more stories like this, but I think that's what got me the most is the money that they were spending on just surviving is now being able to help them to actually live and to be able to lift themselves and empower them to do that. So here's just a few of the little cuties that we met over there. This here is um, an example of a biosand filter. So on that side we've got the dirty water and on this side is how clean it gets afterwards. It's a little way in Kenya. So when we got back from this trip that we did, we realised we haven't had any media. How come media hasn't picked up what we're doing yet? And then we realised it's because we hadn't written to them. So we sent them a letter and we got this call back one day from the um, producer of um, Sunrise. And he said, is it okay if we fly you over to Sydney? I'm like, yes, you can do that. So he flew us over, oh, I flew Dan over at the time and I remember Dan was saying this, he walked in, he goes, can I propose an idea to you? He was like, you can say well, anything you want, Mr. Important Person, propose away. And um, he sent, said this idea, he said, look, we want to send you over over to Cambodia to be able to film the results of what you're doing and then we want to be able to also shoot here in Melbourne to be able to show the factory and all that you're doing. So they ended up doing a two-day feature with us which was amazing even when we're on the field with some of the other team of Sunrise they're like look the most you're going to be able to get is one minute maybe two minute air time you wouldn't get any more than that but they ended up doing 13 minutes across the two days of air time which was remarkable. I don't think we were quite ready for it at that time our 1300 number which is meant to be like you know real professional and stuff was brought to one of our phones and we're still working our part-time jobs and all that sort of stuff on the side in uni so we're literally just getting hounded with phone calls our website crashed and we were quite not prepared for it we were like what are we doing um, however we managed to get through that and it was incredible because we got more um, people involved we got more stockists on board more volunteers um, and, and we really started to pick up from there. So this here is a few of the little pictures there that they did. Then what we did is we wanted to pitch to 7-Eleven. Now, as I've told you the story before of all the other deals that we had done, is um, we, we had right, um, got all these nutbacks. So then we were thinking, what are we going to be able to do to be able to not get a nutback? Most of the times they're like, where's your $3 million marketing campaign? Who really knows about what you are? Like, we don't need $3 million to, you know, market what we do. So we did this, we did this Facebook campaign. And I don't have time to go into it today because I just got the five-minute mark. Um, <laughs> however, there's this... Actually, I might just quickly show this video. I'll click away. Okay. Let's get down to business. All right, it's not working. I'll stop. Basically, we did this campaign where we said... We put it out on our Facebook and we said, if you, we said to our consumers and that, if you want to help us, we're doing a meeting on the 4th of July, we're presenting to 7-Eleven. And we want to show them that we're not the only ones who think it's a good idea. So will you help us get this on board? So basically we said, be as creative as you want. Send us videos, do whatever, but send to their Facebook wall that if 7-Eleven stopped, thank you, what I thought, you'd buy it. Now we were, at, we got a few friends and family ready so we can start that momentum, but we were just amazed at the response after that. And I was going to show you that video, you have to jump online, look at it yourself, but we had people doing dances, we had jingles, we had magic tricks, we had all sorts of creative talent was just coming through. We successfully somehow got the CEO right through down to the secretary, glued to their Facebook wall in, of 7-Eleven. And it was a crazy story that I can't go all into, but we had incredible success as we were walked into their meeting, we were kind of a bit awkward because they're probably looking at us like, who the heck do these kids think they are? However, because of all the experience that we had from the past, all of those knockbacks, all of those meetings that we had, it was like that, that stumbling blocks, that thing that I was saying before, the stumbling blocks are our stepping stones to success. So those, those stumbling blocks that we had were able to teach us what to be able to do in this situation. So we were able to give this presentation, know all the commercial information that we needed to know, and they were able to go, well, so all I need to do is take this on and we look good. And they're incredible. We still have an amazing relationship with 7-Eleven. They do promotions for us now and all that sort of stuff. And our volumes have been able to increase incredibly since then. Now at the moment, um, we've been able to sell at 
probably just gone past our six millionth bottle. We've been able to help 33,500 people receive water for the rest of their lives. Not just through 7-Eleven, we've also had um, that's the, all the other media that we got around the campaign. Um, we have th over now 3,000 stockists worldwide. And um, basically, sorry, I've been thrown off because of the five minute mark. <laughs> so basically, um, we, our journey was quite, it took us three and a half years to sell a millionth bottle. Three and a half years. Nine months after that, we'd sold our fourth millionth. Two months after that, we had sold, sorry, our three millionth. Two months after that, we'd sold our fourth millionth. And now we're on track for, we've done just six million now. So it's incredible the growth that we've had and the people that have come around and supported us and that sort of thing. And something that we found really important is innovation. If we don't innovate, somebody else will, and it's mainly our competitor. So track your impact is something that we brought out from that. And this is something going back to the projects I was saying before. It's so important for us to be able to show our consumers exactly where their money is going, exactly where their purchase is going. So for most charities, and to be able to get the level of reporting that we get, you've got to be able to give a six-digit number. Right? We've been able to work out with our charities in order, a way to be able to give to get this um, reporting that we need. And we're able to start this project called Track Your Impact. Now we've got this um, app here and we've got this code and so you put the code from every single bottle has a unique code, you put that into your app and it will be able to track it back and show you, I think I've got it on there, yep, GPS coordinates, where it is exactly, what project, um, what solution it was, how many people are impacted by the overall solution and just be able to show you. And then my favourite part being in marketing is that you can then share your impact. So you can, you know, just click the little button at the bottom and it will show your friends and your family and so forth on social media that you bought a bottle of water and just helped this village in this place and this is how I've done it. So it's pretty incredible um, that we've been able to do this and it's been a lot of hard work um, getting it all together, working with you know, our web developer and working who's put it all together and then also working with um, you know, our projects team and getting it all together but we finally got there with that. So I'm just going to sum up then just a couple of the points there. The first thing we've got that mindset, that one that I said at the beginning, impossibility, it's only someone's opinion, not a fact. But the perseverance, success can be defined as turning stumbling blocks into stepping stones. And then I wanted to add this last little one, and it's excuses. I love how so many people get ideas, and they're like, oh, I want to do this, but... Oh, I need to do this, but, but, you know. And a lot of people allow their age, their um, level of experience, their qualification or lack of, or lack of money, to be able to limit them from doing the things that they want to go and do in their life. And I've got this incredible story of actually Dan's um, little cousin. And at nine, uh, 12 years of age, he actually said to his mum, I want to sponsor a child. And she's like, great, well, you got to go and get the money yourself. So he didn't stop at that just because he was too young to get a job. He went and started his own business walking dogs. Now we're all over the age of 12 here. Like I think he puts us all to shame right then, you know, and he actually just went out there and did it. And now he's been able to have five, he sponsors five children. He's done some microfinance for a few women in India. He's built a well. He's just going hardcore, just sell, walking these dogs. But what comes with that is another thing that sometimes we forget when we start something like this and something that we definitely learnt along the way is with a lot of these things it also takes sacrifice and Ben for example like I remember when I was 12 years I'd come home from school and just watch cartoons and eat my Milo right he doesn't have that opportunity he comes home from school goes straight out dog walking has birthday parties on the weekend look I can't come I actually have to go dog walking that sounds really cool um, but he, he allows that sacrifice to be able to do these dreams and to be able to do these things that he wants to achieve in his life. So I think that's another thing that sometimes stops us is that, oh yeah, but I don't want to go and do this because then I have to do that. But sometimes you have to go through, get through those sacrifices in order to be able to get that long-term gain that you want to be able to see come about. So that's the end for me today. Thank you for listening to me. I'm really glad I didn't have a coughing fit in amongst all of that. Um, hope you're inspired and feel free to grab a bottle of water and track your impact.